Welcome to the visual episode of this five part series where I talk you guys through the ins and outs of my live streaming home studio. In our overview episode, I briefly talked about different cameras, hardware, software that you can use to achieve a professional look while you're broadcasting. But in this video, I'm gonna deep dive even further into my own visual setup. Let me give you the rundown of exactly what I'm using. As I mentioned in the overview video, I feel like a multi-camera setup, if you have the space and the equipment available to you, can open up so many more possibilities for you, the broadcaster, to interact in uh, unique, new, and kind of creative ways. I feel like it gives you more freedom to move about, maybe show off more uh, of the room behind you as well. And I think it offers just a, an additional professional um, edge to just having the one uh, static cam. So while it's not needed uh, to have a multi-cam setup, dependent on what you're doing, I feel like it definitely adds a little something something, especially for the viewers that are watching at home. As I mentioned previously, the cameras that I'm using, both of them uh, are the Blackmagic Cinema Camera uh, 2.5K. This model is actually discontinued now. You can't find this model anywhere unless it's second hand. Uh, this static cam that I'm looking at right now is something that I picked up uh, relatively cheap second hand. Yeah, if you can find uh, two cameras of the same quality, that's always the way to go, I think, with a multi-cam setup. I've had it before where I've used one of the Blackmagic Cinema cameras with uh, a standard Logitech Pro and that was used for my overhead for my drum kit and the problem that I kind of came up against was really trying to match the quality and the color grade of the two cameras so you're never going to match a Logitech webcam with what the Blackmagic cinema camera can give you so if you can use two cameras of the same quality I feel like those switches between the two scenes appears more seamless and a little bit more professional. For reference, this roaming Blackmagic is using the 10 to 18 mil Canon wide angle lens. I'm using a 28 mil Canon lens on my static cam to kind of create the um, bokeh effect of the background. It's ever so slightly out of focus, as opposed to me, the subject who isn't focused in, in the correct position. You can achieve a better result in terms of really getting a blurred bokeh background effect if you have something like a 50 mil uh, lens, something that I have but can't use in this room because the room is simply not deep enough. If I were to change that lens to a 50 mil, it would be cropped to about to about this. It would be kind of like this, um, and the background would be a little bit more, a little bit more blurred. Um, but obviously, this is this is not ideal. So I use the 28 mil, which is I found a great middle ground with that lens, with the kind of length of room I'm working with. Something to bear in mind with uh, cheaper wide angle lenses. Wide angle lenses are typically gonna be a little bit pricey, but if you go for a cheaper, make a cheaper model, just be wary that that might give you some nasty distortion results kind of on the edges. The wide angle's job is to essentially make what it sees in front of it a little bit a little bit wider, right? Which is essential for what I'm using here in this tiny, tiny box room in my house. So be wary that if you're looking down the wide angle route, going a little bit cheaper can bring up some distorted kind of artifacts that you might find on your end result image. So always worth looking at the higher tiered lenses. I've left some examples in the description below. These are just a few that I'd recommend. This all depends on the camera that you already have and whether these lenses are compatible, of course, but my point being try and steer away from cheaper, wider angle lenses if you can. Cheaper cameras typically have a smaller sensor size as well. So that is also something to bear in mind. Smaller sensor sizes means that the image is cropped a little bit more. So like if you're picking up a cheap camera with a small sensor size, you throw a 28 uh, mil like this, or even a 50 mil, it's gonna be very, very cropped. So it depends on the length of the room you're working with. It depends on where you're gonna be situated in the room. So you have to have a play around. If you have any friends that have lenses that you can borrow and just use to experiment with to see what works for you, I'd recommend doing that. So you can always give them back at the end of the day. Yeah, really it's about finding that middle ground, especially with a multi-cam setup such as this one, where you find the right focal length that's gonna work in both instances. So for a static cam where maybe you're trying to achieve a bokeh effect and with a wide angle cam where, you know, you want more of the room kind of in view. So try and steer away from cheap cameras with smaller sensor sizes and also try and steer away from wider angle lenses that might be a bit cheap as well. 
For color grading, I actually export LUTs from DaVinci Resolve. I have separate LUTs that I use um, dependent on the scene and also dependent on the mode the jungle is in. The jungle has dark mode and light mode, so my LUTs are a little bit different for each of those scenarios. DaVinci Resolve is the software that I recommend for any of your color grading needs, live streaming or otherwise. So if you're already conscious and wary and maybe using some color correction inside of OBS for your streams already, then you're already thinking about the visual aspect of your streams. Now try and take it to the next level. DaVinci Resolve is gonna open up so many more opportunities for you. DaVinci Resolve is super intuitive to use, easy to learn because of the sheer amount of resources and tutorials on the software online. So there's no reason why you shouldn't deep dive into it and begin today. Also, it's free. The basic version is free. The advanced version of the software comes, actually the license comes with uh, any Blackmagic Cinema camera, which is why I use it in the first place. I really wanted to walk you guys through what my uh, typical OBS session looks like. It's something that I get quite a lot of questions about. So let me show you exactly what I'm doing, what plugins I'm using and everything in between. I wanted to jump into settings real quick and show you my streaming output and how I have everything set up there um, because it's a question I get asked a lot. So here it is. I have the encoder set to NVIDIA H.264 and for streaming service encoder settings that is checked. Uh, rate control is CBR, bit rate is at 2,500. Preset is set to quality and profile is set to high. I also have psycho visual uh, tuning checked. Max B frames at two, GPU at zero. So for the plugins that I'm using inside of OBS, I'm using Advanced Scene Switcher is the plugin that is enabling me to automatically have the camera scenes change without me having to touch a single thing. So it's super useful when I'm sat and playing guitar. It can be difficult to get your head around at the very beginning, but you'll get there and once it's set up, then you'd never have to touch it again unless you add more cameras to your setup, then, uh, then it's gonna be a more complicated for you. As OBS is an application that uses an MME driver, if you are using a sound card, then you're gonna have to download a plugin called ASIO driver support. So you can actually use your sound card with OBS. Stream Effects is a plugin that uh, gives you lots of additional uh, filters and features that you can play around with, especially color correction wise inside of OBS. Virtual Cam is a plugin that allows you to basically send out whatever is inside of OBS to applications such as Zoom, Google Hangouts, wherever you need to send your virtual self, you're gonna need virtual cam to do that. So I have my audio PC and my broadcasting visual PC separate. I do have, you know, scenarios where I want to show what's on my audio PC here on my broadcasting PC. So for that, I have a plugin in a side of OBS called the NDI Capture, and this essentially captures what's on my second PC so I could display it inside of my uh, broadcasting PC. So you guys can maybe see what I'm doing over there inside of Ableton. Maybe we're uh, creating a track or whatever's going on. So NDI Capture will allow you to do that if you have two PCs. Um, set up in this way. Let me run you through uh, my scenes real quick uh, and the software that I'm using to capture different sources. So Air Server allows me to screen share my iPhone or iPad. And this is really handy if I wanna very quickly show something up on screen. We talked about this briefly in the overview video, but what's really great about showing uh, or screen sharing your iPhone or iPad as opposed to just maybe your computer screen is that you don't necessarily have to sacrifice, you know, a camera inlay over a 1920 by 1080 image like this. Instead, because of the iPhone or iPad resolution, you almost get, you get more of both sources. So you're not having to sacrifice surface area. You can see two things almost evenly, if that makes sense. I get asked a lot on you now, especially when I'm gaming using my Nintendo Switch, how I'm capturing that device inside of OBS. So let me talk you through it. Very simple. I have my Nintendo Switch in my Nintendo docking station, which has a HDMI out. So it's a HDMI cable out of the docking station into my capture card, which in my instance is a Blackmagic Intensity Shuttle. And then the PC captures that and OBS recognizes it as a source and I'm able to display it inside of OBS for my streams. In my overview video, I talked you guys through how useful my Elgato Stream Deck has been for my streams. It's really changed the game, but something we didn't go over uh, in the overview video that I wanted to touch on briefly is the software that comes with the Stream Deck, how versatile it is, how easy to use it is. So let's run through everything that you can do inside of the software and also what it's compatible with. So here's a look at my Stream Deck again, although this time in our software. So this is essentially where you're gonna control of all of your button commands. You're gonna tell the software what you'd like each button to do. So I'm gonna talk you through exactly what 
uh, Stream Deck is compatible with and it will give you a sense of what you'll be able to do uh, if you were to pick one up for yourselves. If you're working with one of the smaller models of Stream Deck like I am, I'd encourage that you try and think in folders, especially if there's a lot of different things that you're going to want to control with the Stream Deck interface. We talked about all the folders that I have in my overview video, so check that out. But here we're going to talk through how uh, you can essentially set up a new button with a new command. So along the right hand side, you have everything that's compatible, everything that you can essentially do or create into a burn. So if we open up OBS Studio, we have scene. So you can, for example, change scene like I do inside of you now. So here's my perform scene where this triggers the automatic camera change, for example. That is a scene command under the OBS Studio app on the right-hand side in the software. Mixer audio, so you can essentially enable or disable an audio source inside of OBS. Record does what it says, it will automatically record a video that you're creating inside of OBS to your PC. You've got a quick punch stream command. This is something that I have inside of you now and Twitch right here, so as soon as I click that, I'm live straight away. Say if you have multiple sources inside of a scene in OBS. For example, maybe you have two videos or two, three, four separate images that you wanna show. You can use the source command here uh, to essentially enable or disable. You have a basic soundboard where you can play or stop audio. Here's where all the Stream Deck uh, functions are kind of listed. Inside of Stream Deck, you can create a folder, switch profiles. So if you have profiles set up inside of OBS, like I do with uh, YouNow and YouTube, for example, or I have one set up for my Zoom calls in particular, you can switch profiles uh, and make a button inside of uh, your Stream Deck do that. You have what's called a multi-action and a multi-action switch. Multi-action allows one button to essentially do two different actions or multiple actions all at once. So if I wanted to change my scene inside of OBS to uh, my static cam, for example, but also at the same time, I wanted to mute the audio source, then you'd want to use a multi-action command on a button to be able to do that. Say if you want to toggle in between those two different actions in the same instance, then you're going to want to use the multi-action switch. You have a random action command, which can be fun to play around with. A timer, perhaps you're running a competition or something, that's super useful to have just on your Stream Deck that you can start straight off the bat. And that just controls the brightness of uh, your Stream Deck keys. If you're using Streamlabs, which a lot of streamers do, then there's a lot of functions inside of the Stream Deck software, which you can control straight off the bat through your Stream Deck. Inside of the system commands, you can set it up so that Stream Deck will open any website you choose if you, that's something that you want. You have hotkey switches, you can open up any application. There's also specific functions for Twitch that is integrated and compatible with the Stream Deck. You can see a big list of those here. The Stream Deck software is also compatible with Philips Hue. In our overview video, I showed you how I have just a, a Philips Hue bulb uh, in the corner over there. So when I don't have all of the studio lights on, which is most of the time, then I have uh, my Philips Hue uh, light bulb over there and really intuitive to use and great to know, especially if you're using Philips Hue for your colored lights in your background, it's great to have that integrated into your Stream Deck already. So something to bear in mind if you're looking at colored lights, Philips Hue might uh, be a good option for you. Although they're super expensive, just a heads up. <laughs> to show you how easy it is to set up MIDI commands using the Stream Deck, I'm just gonna show you one that we briefly touched on in the overview video. If I click on my verb button inside of the software, it shows you here how we've set this up. So it's a push button type and I'm basically sending the MIDI out to my stream PC and I'm telling that PC and that piece of software that when I push that button, I want my reverb to come on or off. And it's really that simple. A great thing about Stream Deck, if you do scroll down to the bottom of any of these commands, uh, usually they have a help section with documentation, resources, and even forums of people, you know, setting up their own commands inside of their own Stream Deck. So that might also help as well. From a content creation point of view, one of the problems that uh, we've always come up against, and probably it's a common problem for you guys as well, whether you're streamers, musicians, basically if you're creating files on your PC, your laptop, the organization, no matter how organized you are, file sizes, particularly for videos, can kind of dominate your hard drive space. So, because there's multiple computers in this house that I essentially edit on, whether it's Photoshop, Premiere Pro, After Effects, usually I have this PC upstairs, I have my laptop downstairs as well, and James also has has his laptop, which he sometimes uses for audio editing. So it made sense for us to set up a local server, a local network where all of the files would exist in one place, freeing up all the hard drive space on every single 
PC or computer device in the house and everything is living on an actual server as opposed to on our computers. The last thing you want is wasted hard drive space where you have multiples or duplicates of the same file on all PCs. Nobody wants that. So if you had one of the same that's only going to be edited by one person at a time that just exists on a local server. It's super convenient, so efficient, and it's going to completely free up all your hard drive space as well. It's just a common problem that I've come up against over the years in terms of content creation, managing everything, and just being more efficient in terms of the organization on the back end. So setting up a local server and hosting everything on a network has proved super, super handy. So just another tip. If you are going to set up your own server at home, make sure you run everything on gigabit ethernet so you can ensure that you have enough bandwidth. Finally, PC spec wise in terms of visual, I get asked a lot uh, what graphics card I'm using and that's the Nvidia 2080 Ti. In terms of PC builds with live streaming in mind, there's so many resources on YouTube already for this. So instead what I've done is I've given you a comprehensive list of uh, my PC spec down in the description below. It covers absolutely everything uh, that is used in both my streaming visual PC uh, that handles all the visual processing and the PC spec of my audio PC as well. So I really hope that helps. With PC specs in mind or anything visual that we've covered in today's video, if there has been something that's piqued your interest or it's identified a problem that you have in your streams, or maybe you just want us to elaborate a little bit more, then why don't we sit down and have a conversation about it? I've decided to set up one on one monthly calls with people on Patreon for live streaming advice in the realm of tech, in the realm of visual audio, room design, everything we're talking about in this series, but also all the different elements as well that comes with being a live streamer. So it's a very broad conversation that um, I'm kind of opening myself up for with you guys one on one on Patreon. So be sure to check that out. And if there's anything specific in terms of any points that we cover in these videos, or maybe there's more burning questions that you have from a technical aspect as a whole, whatever you need, I'm here to help. So let's talk it through, have a look over on Patreon. Hopefully I can help you more in some way. Next, why don't you go and check out the lighting episode in our series or room design or audio, or even the overview, whatever you haven't watched yet, go and watch everything because all of these videos interconnect in some way. I really hope me talking through my own setup and giving you guys some tips here and there has helped. Remember, you can be a part of the conversation on my Discord server where we have a streaming setup channel, especially for you guys. So check that out. And I hope this has helped in some way. If you found this helpful or if you have any more burning questions, then leave them in the comments below. I'll try my best to get around to all of them. If you've enjoyed this video and it's been helpful, make sure you like and share. And if you have any other burning questions, leave them down in the comments below. Be sure to check out these one-on-one -on -one sessions on my Patreon and be sure to check out my own live streams on YouNow and Twitch too. Thanks for watching you guys and happy streaming.